All right, it's time for our last Jake Z reaction, sorry, review analysis for V0 Season 3. But he's got a lot of fun cut content. Sorry, side stories. That's actually really fun to watch. But this is it. Thank you, Jake, for a wonderful eight weeks of farm. Let's get his thoughts. We know that Subaru as a character beats women. However, it seems that Regulus has also joined the cast of beating Subaru beats women? Which women? Which Unna has he beat? He kicked Elsa. Any other girls? Any other girls? Who has he directly fought with other than Elsa? I'm trying to think right now. Uh, not, I don't know. I don't know. Women. Look at the way he acts. He's, he's never really contacted Sirius either. Capella, did he? Did he land a hit on Capella? I, I can't remember. In the cast of beating women. Look at the way he absolutely manhandles Amelia by grabbing her by the chin. However, the complete violation came when Regulus threatened to kill the other wife, when she didn't even do anything. Yeah. So you can tell that Regulus is actually a top tier wife beater and probably outranked. Also, you're right. Capella did let him hit her, right? With the whip and the rock, just to prove a point. You're right. Subaru. Subaru stones women. He beats women. He stones women. Oh my god. Now, with jokes aside, Let's talk about the episode. As we know, this is the final ReZero episode. So if you want to stay up with the web novel <coughs> and fun facts, then feel free to subscribe and like the video so I can continue to make top tier ReZero content. Because once the anime ends, all of the people that jumped on the ReZero hype train are going to pretty much leave. I'm the only- Yeah, and that's the thing, right? <clears throat> In terms of content creation, that's the problem, right? The problem with content creation on YouTube is it's so counterintuitive where you're rewarded the most by focusing on one topic, one niche. But once that oil dries up, because you can't farm something forever, what do you do? That's why it's, there's like pros and cons of channels like me where we do so much variety content where the average viewership is lower than a one-trick pony channel, like my second channel that only does Beyblade. But at the same time, I never run out of oil because there's such a variety, diverse amount of content pumping out with an audience that is still focused enough where we can start growing and growing independent of trends or not. So I'm really glad that I made the decision to just commit to the horizontal investment diversity shit in order to, you know, have this channel going like sustainably without relying on anything because you guys are now just quoting me to watch whatever I want. But these kind of channels, it's like, what do you do, right? It, it's... You have to like, and here's the thing, if you then jump ship to a different topic, your existing audience that only sub for ReZero won't really watch that. And then it sends even worse signals to the algorithm. But that is an inevitable hit you need to take. You need to take that hit knowing that your viewership will go down, but by being able to evolve your content with different types of content, now, in the long run, you'll be in a better place compared to channels that only focuses on one thing and relying on one series. Only one that makes ReZero videos for years. If you don't believe me, check my account. Go back like seven years, you see that I was still making ReZero videos. So most people are just here for the hype. They don't actually care about ReZero. One of- No. See, what did he just say? People are just here for the hype. They don't actually care about ReZero. Most people are here for the hype. They don't actually care about ReZero is wrong. Most people do care about ReZero here. But they might not care about Jake. And this isn't me trying to be rude. It's just brutal absolute facts about channels that focuses on one thing. And if you don't have a community, you have a community of ReZero enjoyers. But once the anime stops, there's a lot of tourister for sure that only care about the anime only stuff and will leave after until the new season's happening, right? So it's, it's less about like, they, they don't, it's not as, as they don't care about ReZero. They do care about ReZero, but the viewership will go down because the anime is no longer trending. And if you try to do some side stories and cut content and other stuff, that is also a very smaller portion of an audience that is hardcore about ReZero. It's not wide appealing, right? So again, it's just tricky things to maintain when you are so investing vertically into one thing only. And once that trend dies down, how do you survive, right? Once a trend dies down, 
that reflects your true community. That is your true home base of people that will watch you for you rather than the topic you're covering. And that shit is so hard to cultivate, consolidate. It takes so much time. One of Reinhardt's feats, which show that he's really strong, is the fact that he just kicks a door off its hinge and it absolutely splatters Regulus to the floor. Of course, if that was a normal person, they would have been dead. If that was Subaru, he would be dead. But it just goes to show, like, even a random kick just absolutely demolishes most mm -hmm. people. Not only that, Reinhardt has the ability to just get random divine protections if he thinks about it. That's probably one of the best moments. He's like, give me a second. Beep boop, beep boop. All right, I got a call. I got the divine protection. So he was able to just think about it and then get a divine protection, which allows him to see what divine protections people have in order to see what Liliana has. And if he wanted to, he could actually just wish for that divine protection and get the divine protection off the left of feet. Well, if there's a divine protection that counters Saiyans, I, I could agree. Right? But Goku's... In, oh yeah, this is a stupid fucking example they make. It's just for fun. But Goku's entire concept is that he overcomes the impossible. That's why he always wins, because that's his fucking concept. It doesn't matter how high the limit is. He overcomes it. He surpasses it. That's his entire concept. And because of that concept, he can only win. As well. So that's how broken Reinhardt is. It reminds me of when on Twitter I made a post talking about how Reinhardt could slam Goku. And it's got a lot of uh, traction. <laughs> yeah, power scalers, bro. They love this shit. I mean, just compare Goku to anything. Like... Here's what he should have done. I would have put Anya from Spike's family here. Who would win? Reinhardt or Anya from Spike's family? That's the kind of power scaling I care more about. And what's really interesting about the responses is people that talk about Goku don't actually know Goku's powers. And people that talk about Reinhardt usually don't talk about Reinhardt's powers or know his powers. Like if you were to take it to the extreme, because there are some busted divine protections out there. Yeah, and if again, if a divine protection exists where it's just like, he is, <laughs> he can't lose to fucking immigrants. Goku is an immigrant, bro. He's an alien. Reinhardt can't lose to, he's, he's always favorable against a Saiyan or some shit, right? That, that seems like an absolute law. I don't know if you could break that law. If Goku's concept could surpass that, maybe. I mean, Goku's entire thing, again, is to surpass the impossible. Whatever upper limit threshold has been shown, Goku will lose, right? It's always the same shit. He first loses against the strongest new person that showed up. Then we train, train, train. Vegeta then gets sacrificed for no fucking reason other than to glaze Goku. Then Vegeta says, Kakarot, I leave it to you. And then Goku says, all right, I'll do my new thing. New form, new power, fucking we win next. That's, that's, that's pretty much the story of Dragon Ball. We're just landing one sort of little scratch would essentially make Goku lose. On the subject of Dragon Ball, I want to talk about the Yamcha of ReZero. Who is that? Yamcha Felix. Is Felix is Yamcha of ReZero. Say it. Not Krush. Not Krush. Just gets L after L. And in ReZero, this character is, of course, Krush. It does I'd say Krush and Felix is getting L after L. At least Krush had one defining moment during the Whitewell subjugation where she led with the leadership of the speech as it was so great. Felix from the beginning has only been taking L after L after L in my opinion. No matter what happens, like Krush cannot catch a break. She just gets dunked on by anyone. Yep. L Lust, Gluttony, Regulus, like all of them have slammed her up. Like yep. she's absolutely decimated her. True. Not only that, in If Fruits, Krush gets absolutely annihilated by the White <laughs> Well if Subaru is not <laughs> present. Yo, what the fuck is Tape steal with Krush Camp? Why? Why is he doing this? He made him look good just for a bit in season one. And then after that early lead, and here's the thing, right? What happens in early leads and fight, guys? Early lead is never good. Early lead happens, then the opposition gets like a flashback, and then they get a new power and win. Krush, their camp, they got an early lead. Season one, they were ahead. And then no more. It, it's done. They're getting cooked. He looks just also kicks L after L after L. Wilhelm man if he dies and i think he will die i think that it's very fitting for the sword saint and the sword demon to die together and maybe there's some sort of closure sad tragic closure with reinhardt and his grandfather before you know his last you know words 
I could see that. I could totally see that happening. <laughs> if Willem goes to do this camp is cooked. Which means she's also getting destroyed by Sloth as well. So, like, everyone's just gangbanging Krush. And yeah. She's absolutely destroyed. Okay? So, she's an absolute loser in ReZero. In she is. To Krush it sucks. I want to see better of these people, but, like, Jake isn't wrong. They are losers right now, and that's an objective fact, and I wish that they could be better. You have Felix, whose main forte is healing. Yeah. But, like, whenever Krush gets absolutely dogpiled, can't like, do shit. he can't do anything. Yeah. Like, he can't heal her. He can't outheal authorities. So he's also, by extension, useless. Yes, Felix is the most fucking useless character that has gotten this level of glaze. I don't care about Felix fucking patching up wounds and little cuts and maybe even attaching arms. This is some mid-healer shit. You are the strongest healer in Lugunica. You should be fucking performing miracles, bro. You should be fucking cleansing curses, authorities, or whatever, but... It's looking like water magic is nothing in the face of authorities, curses, other powers, right? It's just, they can't compete. Felix is cooked. And then the worst part is how then Felix lashes out because of his own insecurities and gets mad at other people. That is even more despicable because being weak is not a sin. But to lash out to your insecurities and get mad at everyone but yourself? Oh my god, that's some fucking loser behavior. Felix, come on. Why is Felix just trap, you know, cat boy? But that's it. Nobody gives a fuck about Felix other than a little bit of fan service, which died off as soon as fucking Felix, you know, bit the Subaru's ear in season one, and that's been it. That's it. So again, Felix and Krush are the Yamchas of uh, ReZero, and that's a fact. Some Agreed. Like Krush, but she's a loser. I absolutely agree, and I'm not sure how Jake feels about this, but when I say, like, Felix sucks, or Krush is a loser, this isn't me saying it because I hate them. This is an objective fact, an observation anyone can come to. And I wish they could be more hyped up. That's it. That's, it's like a, it's a coming from a place of frustration because they should be better, but... Wah, wah. Krush-san tells me to leave the rest of me to Subaru, right? Then I personally think she has great heroin powers. I like her. <laughs> yeah? I think you like shitting on her. By the way, during the episode, Tape actually said that he likes Krush and that <laughs> she sort of displays this sort of... Who, what, what other characters does Tape like? Because we should be worried for them. Heroin power, which is really funny because he likes Krush and she literally gets dunked on 24-7. Like <laughs> Here's the other thing, though. Um, this could be an insane amount of buildup. Because if you're taking this many L's and this many shitty things happening, if he has plans for a complete reversal, a complete redemption, this is the build-up stage. And later on, maybe there's a moment where all these sufferings actually pays off in such a great way. But again, if that doesn't happen... <sighs> wah, wah. I know this is going to be a hot take and people are going to be like, oh, Krush is the best. Um, but yeah, okay, she's attractive, but she loses everything. Like, what's one win that Krush has done? Like... Aside from season one of the speech and leading people, it, it's, that's pretty much it. Nothing, okay? The, the furthest back you'll have to go is like the EX novels, and even then, <laughs> it's just like, she hasn't really done much. Damn, even in the past, the EX novels, which we will be covering. We will be doing the EX stuff, I think, as February rolls around, but goddamn. As a character. Now, one of the most interesting uh, loose ends was the form of wisdom and we see that Otto independently he can't say Otto but in the previous videos he wasn't uh oh he can't pronounce the T I, I'm confused about this lore of why Jake switches it up uh, loose ends was the tome of wisdom and we see that Otto independently gathered up all the scraps of burned tome of wisdom and he's trying to restore them to see mm. Roswell's plans because he doesn't trust Roswell. However, I don't trust Otto. And if you've watched my content, you will understand why. And again, Tape goes into this. He says, three people that can act safely independently. Reinhard, Otto, and Roswell. <sighs> Otto is Pandora. Yep, yep, Otto is Pandora. What? Roswell is really strong, right? Reinhard is really strong. He's the strongest character in anime. But Otto? 
He's got like no powers. He's got nothing. Like what? He's got like utility and luck, I guess, right? His soul of the language, divine protection, and being able to use insects to his powers, but... He's also lucky because if the mercenary, you know, guards didn't show up from Kiritaka's place, he would have just died to gluttony. But like, what if that's all a lie? What if all of it, it's a lie and he's Pandora? Like, how is that possible? How can Otto be more safe and independent than someone like Subaru, for example? Lucky or as fuck. Aldebaran or Priscilla. It makes no sense. I know. Now, it's crazy. Now, I do feel like most people will miss Priscilla's characterization in this arc. You can see that Priscilla asks if Subaru was the person that spoke on the broadcaster. Yeah. And then she offers to help. And this is something that you need to really understand about Priscilla. Did she offer to help? Or did she say, Oh, you peasants. I guess I could do you a favor. I'll, like, it's a reward for you that I'll help. Yeah, it's an offer. But it honestly sounded like you should be grateful that I'll help you out. Like... I don't, it, it's just the most cocky, arrogant way of doing it. But Priscilla has always shown to like show some favorability. Even if she thinks that you're a monkey and you're just simply dancing for entertainment, if you match her arrogance, I've noticed that every time, if you match her arrogance and pride and kind of stand up for what you believe in, she'll find it amusing and it'll be a favorable experience. But again, if you do some pig's greed shit, <laughs> if you like fucking submit... No, she will kill your entire family. Priscilla's character. While she is prideful, yes she is, she actually does recognize hard work. Yeah. And so if you're someone that works hard for what you believe in, she's actually more likely to help you. And yeah, she has these, uh, I don't want to say dictatorship-like qualities, but very cocky, very arrogant. She's very capable, and she respects meritocracy. If you can prove the results, then... Sure, like, you're good, and that's it. That's what she's doing in this scene, because she actually sees that Subaru is a good character and has actually given him props for what he's done. So she actually does like the speech, even though it's not really inherently said. So maybe she's a bit of a sundere, but that's something... Yeah, I definitely think that Priscilla is closer to a sundere compared to any ar other archetypes. And we specifically saw her smiling every... Royal candidates, you know, was smiling when we were doing the speech. Minus Krush, because, you know. Thank you, Artie, for the two months of Prime, and appreciate it. I feel like most people will miss, and they'll still think Priscilla's kind of cold. Now, one thing we did learn was the biggest revelation, that it seems that Wilhelm's wife is still alive. Mm -hmm. Now, this information should have been revealed at the end of the White Whale fight. Yeah, basically, in the beginning of Season 2, which was pretty much the conclusion of Arc 3 too, because until we had that meeting with Krush, Felix, and everybody else, right? And we talked about disbanding our alliance or not. That was the, basically the final part of Arc 3, I think. And Wilhelm, bro, he, he, he foreshadowed it, but the anime left it out. And I think it's the unfortunate thing for the anime to leave it out because that's so much foreshadowing and theorizing that the anime only could do to come to this. Suddenly, Teresa is showing up because Wilhelm says he has an injury like that, I think isn't as impactful compared to a situation where you've been building up and people are excited of who could this be, who could this be, and boom, it is Teresa. And it's like, oh my god, genius writing, eight years in the fucking making, because, you know, the anime comes in every, like, four-year cycles. However, this was actually cut out of the anime for some unknown reason, so we're just getting it thrown in here, which is yeah. such a shame because it was such great foreshadowing exactly that they just removed it entirely now this of course is is great because we're finally getting that content back in the anime so something that anime failed to do was actually deduce how wilhelm knew that it was Teresia. in that manga we see that wilhelm knew it was her because his wound reopened and that's because Teresia has a very unique divine protection with the divine protection of the death god which means that any wound that she inflicts on you will never heal and if you come into close proximity it opens up to that individual your wound will reopen so it's never really gonna fully heal so that's how wilhelm knew that she was alive because she was the only one that possessed that divine protection of course all of this information was just thrown out of the window now still the anime hasn't really covered some important plot threads so, for mm -hmm. example, Wilhelm mentions that these 
people, Teresia and Kurgan, were resurrected from the dead. And he told Oh yeah, that's the Sphinx stuff, right? The necromancy powers, but that person doesn't exist anymore. Sphinx is actually a witch, but by title only, not a true witch like we know. It's about the demi-human war. However, this storyline is actually adapted into an EX novel. So you can actually read about when Wilhelm was younger, okay. and he actually fought against this sorcerer, this person that could resurrect the dead. However, if you're just an anime-only watcher, you're not going to understand the reference, nor are you going to know who Kurgan is, because Wilhelm actually fought Kurgan when he was younger, and he won. So oh. this is something that, I guess, anime-onlys won't ever experience. Lugunica, Vedra, and Valakia confirmed. And this is the reason why ReZero is such a beautiful medium. Because you do need to sort of read all the side stories and EX novels to truly grasp everyone's character. Yeah, and maybe the anime doesn't need to do such a comprehensive telling of the show. Because the casual audience watching it will get their casual experience and it's probably good for them. And the people that truly want to get more out of ReZero will then go out and reach out to these cut content side stories and get an even more enriched experience. I'm not sure if a one-to-one -one comprehensive, you know, adaptation of ReZero to the anime is a good thing. To me as a hardcore enjoyer, of course I would want it. But I just wonder, like, how the average, regular, common, the casual watching this would feel. I mean, more information is never a bad thing, but I guess that would then kind of hinder the pacing production value. I don't know. Because there's a lot of plot threads that interlink. Either way, this episode was amazing. I actually liked it. I have seen- Schultz is Pandora. Schultz. This kid. Nah, Priscilla's just a Shotokan. I actually liked it. I have seen people sort of call ReZero kind of filler. I might make a video talking about the sort of articles and comments calling ReZero- People who call ReZero filler are the casual audiences that don't grasp the- importance and the weight of what is talked in those quote-unquote filler moments season three episode one for example so much important lore and discussion about what happened in the one year gap and setting everything up as we got to pristilla this is so much important information that if you've seen the you know cut content and know more about the story leading up to this point there is so much you can talk about and enjoy ReZero. but again if you're a casual audience this is gonna seem pointless to you because you can't make the connections, therefore you're getting filtered out due to skill issue. Zero filler, but I'm actually really enjoying it. I think they're doing it justice. They're including cut out material, although they could be doing a tiny bit more. Again, like I said at the start of the video, if you actually want to keep up with ReZero content, yes, sir. the web novel, uh, fun videos I'm about to make, yes, sir. please do subscribe because I'm the only ReZero content creator out there. I wouldn't say you're the only reason a content creator out there. That's like that, that's a crazy thing to say. There's a lot of channels just dedicated for ReZero. But I do appreciate Jake for, you know, going hard with the ReZero content and he's given us so much good content that we can farm. Please go check out Mr. Jake's channel. Give him a sub, give him a like on the video if you did. And regarding, you know, the YouTube shit behind the scenes, yeah, it is unfortunate when your entire channel is based on ReZero, right? And when ReZero is airing and trending, a lot of casuals show up and they want to enjoy it. But they can't really enjoy all of the things because it needs to be from like an anime-only experience to prevent spoilers of future content, right? Jake's done a pretty good job of, you know, a lot of people, they say like, oh, he's spoiling, he does that. I don't think there's been anything that he's done where it's prevented me from like enjoying ReZero. If anything, it kind of enriches the experience, but like... Yeah, you can just keep doing ReZero, ReZero, ReZero. But I think in terms of content creation, it's never a good thing to put all your eggs in one basket. Putting all your eggs in one basket may be optimized to, you know, scale the recommendation system on YouTube. Because again, the more focused you are in a niche and a content, the more accurate the algorithm can push out your videos to that target audience that they know that this is ReZero content, we're going to feed them up. That's why the average viewership of his videos will get so much views right but at the end of the day average viewership of video doesn't mean jack shit because people are limited in what kind of content they can make right if it was so easy to just pop off with like 100k plus you know videos like take a kid now for example if it was so easy to just have 100k videos per reserve content pop up then you would pump that shit like eight times a day like i do but here's the thing they can't that's the setback when you're dependent on a trend or a series right so it's just this counterintuitive thing where 
in the beginning, it may be a good launching pad to kind of grow fast with the recommendation system by being focused on one topic. But then once you run out of the oil, what do you do? Jake is most likely going to cover some side stories and extra, you know, filler content. Filler, I say, but more extra content that ReZero fans can eat up. And I'm sure they'll do well, but sometimes it's worth to diversify your portfolio to kind of put your toes in the water, ask your audience, what else do you watch? What other things, you know, do you guys enjoy? And then if he can find that audience from his existing community and start making videos for them and start to expand, then suddenly you will be able to horizontally invest. You will be able to sustain and outlast these trends because if you're dependent on a trend to carry you, there's no stability. You can't do this shit full time. The only reason I can do this shit full time right now is because I've set up such a base foundation where I am making so many videos, but it's carefully curated from what my audience ask. And as time passes, more and more of momentum builds up where people are now watching me for my personality rather than the content. Like you guys probably have no idea. And maybe there's no need to do this shit right now. But like a lot of people think that just because like, like what's the average viewership, right? What's the average viewership in my channel right now? It's about two to three K, right? After a week, it should be about two to three K is the average viewership for like a community series. Sometimes with trends, you're gonna get more viewership, but notice how in comparison, this is not very high to let's say Jake's videos, right? Let's look at Jake's videos, right? Notice how average viewership, he gets like over 10 K easy. And I'm sure this will build up. But guess what? I'm hitting 1.4 mil right now. And a lot of people, and I don't, well, let's bring up Echidna, for example, right? 1.2 to 1 mil. And that's fantastic. He's killing it, right? But when Reezer goes out of style, a channel of 308k subs, even when the trend is happening, I'm doing better. And I'm not saying like I'm better than Echidna. I'm not saying that like, oh, I'm flexing. No, I'm trying to tell you from a person that's really obsessed about the algorithm and trying to build a brand and a business that you don't need to care about average viewership per video if you know that each video is catered towards an audience that's watching you for you. Me, bro, like Echidna gets hundreds of thousands of views per video, right? The average viewership is so high because it's so locked in into this ReZero niche, right? He's also had an early market capture because I think he's been making ReZero videos like five years ago along with Jake, right? That's great. But how the fuck is a person like me that's not even crossing 5,000 per average view viewership on a video doing better than someone getting like this? Because average viewership doesn't fucking matter because at the end of the day, he can't make more videos like this. He's locked into this fucking thing. He is tied, he's bound to this ReZero content. And when ReZero is there, he's gonna get way more views than I could ever fathom on a single video. But it turns out in the game of YouTube, there's so many videos that people come in, people that watch this shit will go back to the you know, different playlists and keep watching all these different videos. They all trickle up. And this is what matters, right? Having a community that will watch you for whatever rather than being tied to one specific thing. But in order to do this, like you have to take some hits. You have to like actually shoot yourself in the foot and pivot content and your viewership will go down. But there's no easy way out of it, right? This is the shitty thing about YouTube where you are rewarded for being focused on one single thing. And the more you try to diversify, the shittier it is to grow. But in long term, this is the way. And in short term, the, you know, like even my second channel, right? Like even my second channel, like you look at this shit. Every video gets so much higher viewership, but I can't pump out more Beyblade videos because Beyblade's running out and then I have to pivot into something else. So I'm getting really off topic here. This is just the whole tangent about why average viewership doesn't matter because some people can't simply pump more of that content because they're bound to that specific content that is limited of. But if you're able to somehow, some way, round up the monkeys, and make dudes watch you for whatever it is. It's a lot more sustainable in the long run. Anyways, that's pretty much it. Please go check out Jake's again. Here it is. Here's a link. Please go check out Jake's videos. I hope that he'll make more ReZero content that we can react to that is 
anime only safe because you know i don't want to get spoiled by extra shit but that's it bye bye